Yeah, thank you very much uh, for this uh, opportunity. I think I should uh, congratulate the uh, Law Society here for uh, having such an event uh, in these dark times. And uh, as the poet said, I think singing about the dark times is the best thing that we can do. Uh, my association with uh, Dr. Jain Sai Baba goes uh, long back to almost 25 years when both of us were students at the Central Institute of English and Foreign Languages, CIEFL, which is also known as the uh, EFLU, e English and Foreign Languages University, uh, Hyderabad. Should I move the side or? I'm audible there, right? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, both of us were students and uh, the CIFL campus in those days was, I think, very much like uh, uh, what uh, National Law University is now. I mean, we, you have, I was told, around 400 students. I think we had even less. And the students were all teacher trainers there. So it was uh, mostly in-service teachers, uh, a very kind of apolitical kind of uh, student commu community. Actually, they didn't identify as students. They were called participants there. So, uh, and we were one of the first batches of uh, real students there. Uh, even Sai Baba was a student at that time. And uh, we were, uh, I was the secretary of the Participants Association. And um, it was during one of the struggles for the workers, mess workers there, uh, who were paid around 300, two to 300 rupees in those days, when the minimum wage, I think, was maybe 4,000 or so at the, in those days. But these people were not permanent employees, although their work starts like from 6 to 10 in the evening, 6 in the morning to 10 in the evening, and they would go get paid two to three hundred rupees. So some of our students thought this is inhuman, so we should do something. Uh, we could not make them permanent, but at least we said we, they should get minimum wages, and we led a struggle. And Sai Baba was also very supportive of that. And I remember and the, as the Participants Association Secretary, when I read out the report, uh, he came to me personally and said uh, it was a very good uh, report, and uh, he congratulated me. Actually, that was my first interaction with him. Uh, from then onwards, like uh, uh, of late, uh, over the last uh, 10 years, we have been colleagues together in the Delhi University. I also teach in the Department of uh, English in the University, and Sai Baba teaches in one of the colleges there. So I'll uh, try to be brief and uh, not to be repetitive because some of the points have already been covered. So I'll just read parts of what I have uh, written down. So uh, Dr. G. N. Sai Baba, an assistant professor of English at the Ramlal Anand College, University of Delhi, has been in and out of prisons from May 2014, first as an under trial for more than two years, and then convicted for life imprisonment under various sections of the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act 1967, UAPA, as it's called. A legislation that criminalizes ideology and association, even when there is not even a remote connection or suggestion of the perpetration of a violent act. So this is one aspect which I'm going to speak about. To talk about Sai Baba today itself has, uh, today has itself become an act of defiance in the light of the reign of terror that the state is unleashing on the activists and friends who are defending him. If recent news reports are to be believed, there seems to be a well-scripted move to single out and hunt down all those who are fighting for justice for Sai Baba, including the defense lawyer who is currently in prison, and some of the key members of the committee of the defense and release for Dr. G. N. Sai Baba, also called the defense committee. So def defense committee will be this, this committee. An association formed informally by friends and colleagues of Sai Baba and some social and cultural activists. The defense committee also has been ably supported by organizations like the Delhi University Teachers Association and its members, who unanimously passed a resolution in support of Sai Baba, even when the college where he is employed is trying to terminate his services in the wake of the trial court judgment. So eager are they to dismiss him that they do not want to wait till the appeal is disposed of by the High Court. So even when the uh, appeal is pending, the college has already initiated uh, the procedure to terminate his services, of which uh, Vasanta also made a mention of. Two points need to be highlighted about the judgment delivered by the Sessions High Court. The first is, actually, uh, Professor Hargobal mentioned both this. The first is what I could call the lynch mentality of the judge when he says that his hands are tied by law. 
such that he can only give life imprisonment. I mean, this is no other, nothing other than lynching. I mean, he would, he's basically saying I would have lynched him. Second is his apprehension about Sai Baba being mentally fit, although his body is disabled. That is to say, the working of the mind, it is the working of the mind that the state fears. And the judgment says, even if it is uh, not in so many words, that the machinery of the state will go to any extent to curb this. I would want to flag two issues for discussion today. The ways in which statutory provisions have been overlooked or violated in handling of Sai Baba's case with the collusion of legal machinery and the law enforcing agencies and the place of draconian laws like the UAPA in the constitutional scheme. The first has aspect has been led uh, threadbare in a booklet titled, which I think all the speakers were holding and some of you are already familiar with, uh, When Prosecution's Case Becomes the Judge's Honours, Miscarriage of Justice on Sai Baba, Him, Prashant, Mahesh, Pandu uh, and Vijay. This is brought out by the Defence Committee. The, this ranges from inconsistencies in the story of the prosecution. I'm not going into the, all the factual details, but they have uh, narrated it uh, in detail. Material contradiction of facts, conjuring up of stock witnesses, somebody who cannot distinguish between gadgets like a pen drive and hard drive was called upon as a punch witness. I mean, he openly said in the court that I do not know what a hard drive is, but then he is si to supposed to sign documents saying that hard drives were recovered and so on. Uh, when friends and even lawyers were available, I mean, his colleagues are there, but they do not want them as witnesses. Uh, uh, Non-cooperation, non-production of certification under 65B of the Evidence Act, authenticating of electronic evidence during the trial. This was, the certificate is produced much later in the process. Now, Sai Baba, along with five others, have been convicted for offenses under sections 13, 18, 20, 38, and 39 read with 120B of IPC. Now, uh, section 13 is about uh, taking part in uh, unlawful activity, which says uh, whoever takes part or commits uh, offenses or assists any unlawful activity gets five terms. Now, the point is that there is no offense that is made out in the 820 pages of judgment. There is not a single mention of any offense that they have committed. No offence made out to show that they participated, advocated, abetted or incited the commission of any unlawful activity or assisted the commission of any unlawful activity. But still they are convicted under this. Now punishment for conspiracy, that's section 18 of UAPA, uh, says conspires or attempts to commit or advocates commission of a terrorist act. Now the word terrorist act is important there. That means section 18 says you are you have conspired for uh, commission of a terrorist act, and terrorist act is defined in section 15. So, for a person to be pu pu punished under section 18, an offence should be made under section 15 of UAPA, but that has not been done. So there is no mention of any terrorist act that they are punished, uh, they have uh, committed or abetted or whatever, but still they are punished under this section. Now, punishment is also under Section 20. I think that's the most stringent punishment here for life imprisonment. Punishment for being member of terrorist gang or organization. Now, it's very clear, and I'm sure mo you people know more than uh, me better, that uh, mere, the Supreme Court in various pronouncements has said that mere membership of uh, even a banned organization is not punishable. One has to show that you are you have participated actively in activities of that. Now, there is no uh, such uh, mention. The only connection they make is Sai Baba holds these views and the, law, the views of this organization is also the same. Henceforth, he is a member of that organization. I think Hargobal narrated it very uh, clearly. So this is the only link. So it's clearly association by thought and uh, by uh, the, the, it's the ideology that connects them. 38 and 39 relates to membership uh, of uh, organization and supporting activities of organization and so on. So uh, here, as I said, there is no link established uh, that he is actually a member, uh, other than certain kinds of correspondences which they have produced, which are also highly debatable. The booklet discusses that, and uh, I, I don't want to go into the, such technicalities. Now, uh, Let's take a look at the UAPA itself. I'd like to spend, uh, I think, uh, maybe another five minutes on that. Um, at the outset, I would like to note that UAPA is not just a le legislation that criminalizes thought 
I mean, usually we say that it criminalizes thought, but I say it also criminalizes an emotion, not just thought, but an emotion. Uh, the point is section 2 uh, of 2O of the UAPA Act defines unlawful activity. I'll just read that. I'm sure you are familiar with this, but I'll let me just go through this. Uh, unlawful activity in relation to an individual or association means any action taken by such individual or association, whether by committing an act or by words, either spoken or written, or by signs or by visible representation or otherwise. I'm sure you're immediately reminded of some other laws, right? Uh, one, two, three, there are three subclasses. I'll read the third one. Uh, which causes or, int or is intended to cause disaffection against India. So that's the crucial thing. Whoever causes by all these signs or spoken word, disaffection or <coughs> intended to cause disaffection against India. This is fel well known. While it is beyond my competence in psychology to distinguish between thought and emotion, it's clear that disaffection is an emotion that may or may not lead on to a thought, or it could be the other way also. Thoughts can also create emotions. I don't know. Uh, and uh, action. So it could lead on to a thought. It could lead on to an action. Disaffection, which can be characterized as a state of, a state or feeling of being dissatisfied. Um, that's a dictionary definition is not unheard of in the legal parlance. In the criminal jurisprudence, a uh, parallel can be drawn to the law of sedition. This is the law which I think immediately you would have uh, recalled. Now, I draw upon a paper written, co-authored by me and uh, a an, uh, friend of mine, uh, which discusses the law of sedition. So I try to draw uh, a parallel. Now, the law of sedition, as we know, says the same thing, whoever by words either spoken or written or by signs or by visible representation, same words, or otherwise brings or attempts to bring into hatred or contempt or excites or attempts to excite disaffection towards the government established by law in India shall be punished. This is the, so again, disaffection towards the government established by law. Uh, and uh, explanation, there is also an explanation saying that the expression disaffection, uh, disaffection includes disloyalty and all feelings of enmity. So it's very clear, it's the feeling that. Now, the, I mean, this is strange, I would say. How can a feeling can be criminalized, right? I mean, uh, uh, imagine a, you know, a, a patriarchal father saying that you should not hold any ill will against me. I mean, that, that itself is going to be punishable. Uh, the courts have tried to serve the law of sedition by making a distinction between the literal interpretation, which criminalizes all speech that incites disaffection, and a liberal interpretation in which only disaffection that leads to incitement of violence, which ultimately affects public order, uh, that needs to be criminalized. So the, I mean, the, how this has been read down, as you know, is that it's not all feeling, but if the disaffection leads to violence into action, then that's... Uh, kind of uh, criminalized. And uh, this is, as you know, saved by the uh, First Amendment of the uh, Constitution where the crucial words public order was inserted. I sometimes forget that I'm talking to law students because I generally address uh, what you call uh, lay uh, people. Uh, now, however, the Allahabad High Court in the case of Ram Nandan in 1958 had taken the view that even the First Amendment could not save Section 124 of IPC. The reasoning that 124A of IPC can be saved in the interest of public order has been meticulously analyzed. They argue that public order cannot be said to be affected when there is no incitement of violence. However, in Section 124A, the provision inflicting violence upon speech or in other words, the language of 124A cannot be stretched in such a way that words or signs that merely excites or attempts to excite hatred or contempt or disaffection without inciting violence can be separated from words or signs that incite violence. So the question is about the severability of this. Can you say that when you say there is only uh, incitement of violence, that can be separated? Uh, and Allahabad High Court in 1958 uh, concluded that it cannot be, therefore, even one, the First Amendment of public order cannot be saved. And it's also important to remember that since it was the, uh, the amendment of Article 19.2 that was responsible for the revival of the question about the constitutionality of the Section of 124A, uh, we have to read the 
uh, section in respect to the amendment itself. Yeah, I think I'll try to uh, finish in five minutes. So, I mean, I'm going into a d uh, detail of the um, amendment there. I, I'll skip that part. Now, basically, what it says is that uh, the Constituent assemb Assembly was very clear that uh, sedition should not be a, a clause under which uh, freedom of speech of expression can be curbed. Now, if you look at the law of sedition and UAPA, they are parallel. So, UAPA is also basically a law which I would say is unconstitutional. And as law students and maybe future lawyers, activists, I think uh, this is the right forum where you know that kind of move can be taken. There are already campaign against uh, lots of campaign against UAPA. So I would kind of make an appeal that uh, this uh, particular the audience here also should uh, take part of part in that. Uh, yeah, I skipped this part on the UAPA. Uh, I mean the amendment itself. Uh, the only, I'll just quote w one uh, aspect from Munshi's speech in 1948 in the Constituent Assembly, where uh, he clearly said the sedition should not be part of the